Uh, welcome everyone to the East Side Theater Library. We're here in person, and we are glad that you are joining us virtually or the uh, afterwards the, the recording uh, that we put on on YouTube. Um, this is the East Side Theater Library. Uh, we're glad that you have joined us for one of our many uh, events for, for this great event. I want to thank Sherry for not only assembling a great uh, collection of writers, but together this important work about sharing our voices and the take that space that we're exposed to, um, but also uh, putting together this collection of readers for this event. So thank you for uh, bringing this into our space, both the Central Library space and the broader community space. Um, but there are some really important things that I really admire and respect a lot in this collection. And uh, I am really looking forward to the trailer. Um, I'm really nervous that I've never done this before throughout the pandemic. I think we know my hand really on the camera. But here I am, this is an important work and it's the book that we would all hear. Um, I want to thank Claire and uh, Peter and Matt here who um, run East Texas in my way. This is the second way we were done. We have a book first came out. We have a first um, reading here. Some good to do that. Um, and I'm so excited that there's a new writer Junior, who passed in 2021. He's a playwright and he had connections to Minnesota, even though he was a Montana um, resident and also taught out in Maine. Each of the writers are going to introduce themselves and they're going to focus on, on how dare they write and also on literary spaces, creating literary spaces, which I am. Um, took from Neil, and I'm sure he'll tell you a little more about that, creating literary spaces. Um, what did I forget? The one thing about the book that I like to mention is that it includes not only academic writers, um, but community writers, writers who write for their own personal reasons, for healing reasons, and um, and all different genres are included in it too. So thank you. Um, I don't know if I forgot anything, I probably did, but I want each of the writers to have at least 10 minutes to share their work and to introduce themselves. And Darlise is going to be first. She's out on the East Coast. Great, thank you all so much. I'm really, really grateful to be here humbled and inspired to be part of this um, this event and also this project. I was really, really grateful that I was asked to contribute. Um, yeah, my name is Dara Lise Lyons. I work full time actually as a diversity, equity and inclusion strategist, a writer. Um, I've had the opportunity to speak um, really actually in, in radical ways. Like I was able to do a TED talk and, and just other amazing things as a result, I think of my identity and the unique non-binary space that I occupy as a black, white, biracial person. And um, so I was really grateful to be able to contribute to the anthology. And I will say that when asked to read something today, I uh, actually didn't want to read something from How Dare We Write because I feel like, um, 
you all should buy a copy of the book or, or, or to take out a copy of the book um, on library loan. And so I, I decided to write a piece um, or to read a piece that I wrote in February of 2020. It was published in the Broad Street Review, which is a Philly based um, publication. And it, it the title of this piece is how being both black and white helped me embrace all aspects of myself. And just for context, it came out around Valentine's Day. So the piece is about loving all elements of myself. Um, I grew up the biracial daughter of a white single mother in a town with very little racial or ethnic diversity in the early 1980s. In honor of Black History Month and Valentine's Day, I'm sharing my experiences as a person who has used difference as a doorway rather than a wall. In my hometown, nobody was validating non-binary identities and experiences. Everyone I knew who was of a mixed race background identified with their marginalized race to the exclusion of all others. I had several friends with one white and one black parent tell me they were black and even voiced their hatred of white people. But your mom is white, I'd say. You're part white. Do you hate part of yourself? Mine was an unpopular opinion, one I learned from my mother who never cared about succumbing to societal pressures. When I was growing up, and even now, my mother's ideas would have been considered at best nonconformist and at worst antagonistic. She was a white woman who fell in love with a black man and didn't care about stigmas regarding interracial couples. She got pregnant when they were dating, and even though they broke up long before I was born, she decided, impervious to the opinions of others, to raise me on her own. My mother taught me to be fiercely independent, unwaveringly honest, and unapologetically myself. She also taught me to be proud of my heritage. She joined a group for interracial parents and their mixed race children, took me to black owned hair salons, befriended people of all backgrounds, and joined a POC owned and operated organization dedicated to promoting representation of marginalized identities in literature. With her steadfast insistence, on telling me the truth, her willingness not to give in to the pressures and expectations of contemporary culture. She told me I was both black and white and that I should self-identify as such. Other parents of biracial children and many of her friends and probably even some family members told her the world would see me as black. The implication being that I should base my understanding of my race and on myself on the perspectives of others. By refusing to succumb to the majority point of view on race, a point of view that was codified into popular culture as a direct result of the racist ideology of the one drop rule, my mother gave me the gift of self-love. One of the things I've come to realize about love is that it is only truly love if it's inclusive of all aspects of a person's identity. I can't say I love, I'll love myself when I lose 10 pounds or I'll love you if you change this or that about yourself. Love is unconditional and encompasses and embraces the whole person. I can't say I've loved myself my whole life. I haven't. At some point in adolescence, I started placing conditions and contingencies on myself as opposed to knowing my intrinsic value. Then in my mid twenties, I made the decision to radically and unapologetically love myself, all of myself. Luckily, I had race as a reference point. In that area, I always comfortably existed in the rainbow of colors between black and white. I honor and appreciate the rich tradition of African-American storytelling, music, cuisine, and the resilience of a people who fought through oppression and have continuously demonstrated the beauty of the human spirit. At the same time, I also honor and appreciate the culture and cuisine of my white ancestors. I don't remember the first time I heard someone say, love may be a feeling, but it's also a choice. I do know that when it comes to race, those words resonate very deeply with me. Embracing the full spectrum of my ethnic and racial identities has meant refusing to participate in a set of power dynamics that create racial binaries, hatred, and discrimination. Instead, I choose and have always chosen to unconditionally and unapologetically embrace all of my racial identity. For a long time, I was less self-accepting when it came to other things, like my body weight or shape or other areas where I felt pressure to be different than I was and to conform to societal standards. 
When I decided to choose self-love in every area of my life, I committed to no longer trying to change my my gangly arms or the circumference of my thighs to being okay with my poor sense of direction and the ups and downs of my emotions. I got comfortable existing in the spectrum between extremes. I don't pretend to understand what other people need in terms of love or racial identification. But my personal experience has taught me that appreciating all of me has opened the door wide to a life that is filled with amazing and varied opportunities and experiences. I have a great unwavering hope that more people will allow themselves to embrace a more inclusive, less binary understanding of race. It seems to me that if we could all get more comfortable with blackness and whiteness, we'd be able to move past so much hatred of ourselves and others and move forward in love, inclusion, and unity. Um, So that's what I decided to read to you all today. And yeah, I think um, in terms of how dare we write, how dare I write, my life experiences make me uniquely equipped to tell my story and to own my voice, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So I'm really glad to be here, and I can't wait to hear from others, and I'll pass, and thank you so much. Oh, I forgot my water bottle. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Marlena Gonzalez. Um, my name is not Marlena Gonzalez. My name is Marlena Gonzalez. Um, <laughs> I have to say that because what I'm going to be reading has a lot to do with language and how we utter our language and how we speak our language and how we say our language. I'm in love with language. As a bilingual person, I'm fascinated by the tricks that my mind plays when I'm writing because the intervention of English keeps succeeding over the first language of my soul, which is Tagalog. Um, I'm originally from the Philippines, born and raised in Manila before we came over here, but I grew up being surrounded by storytellers. I realized that I was nourished by milk and stories uh, from the get-go. And to this day, my mom who stays with me some, you know, six months out of the year, always catches me unaware in the morning before my cup of coffee because she breaks out into stories. And in my mind, I'm like, I got to record this. I got to record this. And I have been recording it. The tragedy is like a few days ago, after submitting a grant, I went back to my phone and realized that the app I was using to record her stories had been discontinued and I can't download them. So the tragedy of that loss made me even more aware of the importance and the value of preserving our stories by any means necessary because they're fleeting, but they're also, but they need to be infinite. So I'm gonna read, before I read, I drink water. I'm gonna read um, parts of the piece uh, from what I wrote in How Dare We Write. I'm very honored to be in the company of all of these amazing writers whom I admire because, and this is funny, like I was at an event just a few days ago and I was being introduced to a young writer and the person who was with me introduced me and said, well, Marlena is also kind of a writer. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'm kind of a writer because I don't write as often as everybody else, I guess, referred to as a writer because I am very multidisciplinary. I'm a curator, I'm a playwright, I'm a poet, I'm an essayist, I'm an oral storyteller, I'm also in media, and I'm like just a woman who does too many things. Um, (laughs) So thank you for welcoming me to this circle, Sherry. I can see Carolyn and Lori and um, Marcy and all of you online um, for being in this company. And today I'm going to be sort of a writer. (laughs) So the piece that I wrote um, 
I thought I was going to time myself, but maybe just cut me off if I go too long. The piece that I wrote in the book, How Dare We Write, which I've also used in some of the classes that I teach. Um, I, by the way, teach, uh, I teach Introduction to Pan Asian Theater at Oxford University and started teaching a new course through Asian Pacific American Resource Center called Black and, a Black and Asian Solidarity and Community. And Carolyn is actually one of our guest speakers. And the university decided to continue it because the students were like, no, this can't just be one semester. So we're going to teach, we're going to offer the course again in January. So, and I've offered these writings from, you know, for the students to consider. The piece that I wrote is called Dancing Between Bamboos or the Rules of Wrong Grammar. And I make a reference to the very popular Filipino dance called Pinikling, where you see dancers jumping between clapping bamboos. And the origin of that dance is really uh, <clears throat> based on the tradition of farmers trying to catch the, the bird called Pikling when they're, you know, so that they don't invade the seeds and when they're planting and they have these two bamboo sticks that snap so that the birds don't eat up the seeds. And it, it is the origin of the dance that you claim. But I also felt that that dance is so much a metaphor for what happens in my brain. And, and all of us who are bicultural, bilingual, um, multi-universal creatives that were always caught between two clapping bamboos and usually the clapper is the dominant culture that's trying to catch us unawares. So dancing between bamboos are the rules of wrong grammar. I opened this book by a quote from my own piece. I mean, this, this, piece, this short poem that I wrote. I still live in you, mga kundiman, balagtasan, and harana, music of Vandurias, beat of bamboo stalks. It was from a poem I wrote called Filipinas, Filipinas Hindi Kita. So you'll hear me speak Tagalog because I want you to hear me speak Tagalog. My challenge as one who speaks and writes in more than one language or one tongue is that I have this puzzlement of a two-lane writing brain. I want to repeat the unforgettable stories cluttering or clattering inside me or chattering inside me, stories spoken and written in the slow, thoughtful voice of our late Inang, my grandmother, visually vivid memories <clears throat> shared by my mother, my mother, um, occasionally punctuated with a lilting punto or accent of Nuwai Sihanos, which is the province that she came from. The meandering, energetic, gestural, cinematic mind of my late father, uh, <coughs> whose pronunciations could zigzag between Lawrence Olivier's British to indigenous Pangasinense. Other than often told with his hands, framing the world so he can see the movie screen in his mind. In some way, seeing paragraphs like the one you just read, referring to the experience of reading that first paragraph in the book, written with words from and with different languages, dialects, and that critical marks is a visual delight for me. But my attempts to capture their indigenous vocabularies, the multisyllabic, rhythmic, deeply poetic, entertainingly naughty, are often interrupted by the grammatical imp imposition of my English, mostly education. My writing fingers wish to defy the language barriers between my first and second language, wishing to preserve the metaphors of the first, Tagalog, I find myself writing between two clapping bamboos. I wish I could offer single language readers some magic potion to drink so that you too can skip with agility between my clashing languages. Tagalog is derived from the word tagailog, meaning of the river, or one who hails from the river. I was born in Manila. The name itself is derived from the phrase my nila, which literally means there is a flower called nila floating on the river. Nila is a flower often seen floating or growing along the Pasig River. Even the name Pasig is a derivative of pas sigine, 
a Spanish phrase, a final cry from a legend about a die, a drowning Spaniard calling out to his Filipino lover, Paz, pa Paz, come with me, Paz, peace in Spanish. So when I'm asked, where are you really from? What language do you, do you speak? I lied with some answers, albeit with a secret belly laugh. I was born in Manila. My first language is Tagalog. If you were satisfied by that simple response, you would have only heard a third of the answer because the, sim the simple sentences really carry three stories. I speak the language of the river that flows through the city where the flower me like floats and where legend has it, a drowning Spaniard uttered a final request to his Filipino lover named Peace. Jose Rizal, the revolutionary Filipino Renaissance genius of literature, science, and politics in Filipino literature, wrote one of his earliest poems, Mother Tongue, at the age of eight. And he said, because, because by its language, one can judge a town, a barrio, a kingdom. Our language is so important, even if we speak the same English, we are really speaking different languages. How we speak English is how we see the world, how we sense the world, how it was introduced to us by our own mothers. And so Filipinos usually jokingly say, we can speak Spanish, Tagalog, and English all at the same time. So depending on which, Tagalog, which language is being predominant, you're either speaking Taglish, Engalo, or Spanglish. And that's my bi bifurcated tongue. Um, let me know how I'm doing with time. If I have a little bit more time or two minutes. Okay. Um, so before I lose my two minutes, I'd like to read um, a piece from a play that I wrote that was produced a few years ago called Isla Toledo or Island of Confusion. And it was a section was really lifted from the speech of President William McKinley, whose 1899 speech defended US expansionism as manifest destiny and justified the Congress to the Philippines. But this was delivered. I kid you not, I took the words and then kind of like put some inflections on it, but this is the words of a president of the United States. A golden light just shone over our worried little blonde heads. Somebody died for us so we could be saved. It's our responsibility to do the same for you. This is addressing Filipinos saying, this is why you need to be part of us or that we need to rule you. We should stay here, justifying American presence in, on the Philippine Islands and help you all have a better life because it's our God-given right to teach you all um, and to uplift you all and, and to civilize you all so we can save your pagan souls. So you all can go to heaven because you all claim to us as a gift from God, our, brown, our little brown brothers and sisters. Someone died for us to save our souls and now we have been cleaned and we can clean you too and teach you to teach to talk like this, not to talk the way you do. You deserve to know how to enunciate and to pronounce your words clearly, to be, you know, civilized. And once you've learned all that, then you'll be just like us, you know? And if someone made, a, this one I made up, if someone made a movie about this, dream that I had last night. It should be called Our Magnificent Dream, aka Your Manifest Destiny. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I guess I'm up next. I'm Neil Aiken, uh, and my essay is a new addition to this edition. Um, and I will be reading, well, I, I was thinking if I should introduce myself or let the, the essay introduce myself, which I feel like it does a decent job. Um, but uh, the specifics of where I'm at, I'm in Canada, in Saskatchewan right now. After many years of living in the U.S., I moved back to Canada. Um, and I'm of uh, Chinese, Scottish, and English ancestry and grew up internationally um, in a number of different places. Imagining Home, Creating Literary Spaces of Change and Possibility is the title of my essay. Um, growing up in a family where we moved often across national and international borders, home was never a physical location, but rather more of a configuration of people and the books we loved and carried from place to place. There is a rootlessness I often feel in my core when someone asks me where I call home. No one place pops into mind, but rather a reminder that I'm always adrift, always inventing home wherever I find myself. To be born between cultures, languages, and countries is to be the product of a confluence of histories and silences. Many rivers run together in me. Although I could name them Chinese, Taiwanese, Scottish, and English, these labels are never sufficient. They obscure the complex stories of the individuals who came before me, who, like me, failed to fit neatly into the boxes that others have defined. We overflow our bounds, we disappear into the earth here, reappear elsewhere. There are hidden reservoirs, underground lakes, and unknown caverns that connect us together that we draw on when we write. My father often told me that you can't draw water from an empty well, but as a writer, you have to spend time reading and living, letting the water accumulate. When I was an undergraduate student pursuing a degree in computer science while writing on the side, I began buying poetry books as a way to educate myself, to start filling that well. I didn't have an agenda, but would wander shelf to shelf and use bookstores, pulling down books with interesting titles, leafing through their pages, searching for lines and images that startled me or shook me. I didn't know who they were. Uh, judge them only by their lyricism and imagination, the music of their transcribed voices ringing in my head. I bought book after book, assembled them into shelves, then read them frequently. I bought more and more. When I graduated, I took my fledgling collection with me and moved back to Canada for a short time, then landed a programming job in Los Angeles. I didn't realize how deeply ingrained the impulse to collect books ran in me, not so much as a proof of material wealth or a demonstration of intellectualism, but rather as a way to keep pushing the boundaries of the known world, humbling myself in the process by filling my shelves with reminders of how much I did not know of the myriad ways in which the universe is filled with wonder and surprise, how beneath and beyond everything else it is grief and joy and yearning that binds us together as human beings. When I look back now, I see quite in, unintentionally and unconsciously I was building a personal library as an act of resistance to those voices or societal forces that sought to erase me and others who were pushed to the margins, who did not fit within what was deemed mainstream, popular, and canonical. One book at a time, I was building a fortress and a sanctuary. My sister once explained to me that the difference between an apartment and a home is that one is a place where you store things and sleep, and the other is a place where you are yourself. My personal library became my home. I left the programming job to pursue an MFA, then later a PhD. I crossed back and forth across the border. I completed my studies, failed to find an academic position, and moved to the Portland area, where I worked and volunteered in literary and cultural organizations. Wherever and whenever I moved, although I might jettison furniture and clothing, I would always bring my books with me. And during the times when I could not afford my place, I sorted through the collection, selecting a core hundred books that I felt were essential to my sense of self and took these, putting the rest in storage. This is how I survived. My library grew from a few hundred books to over a thousand. Today, I have over 1300 books. It's actually probably more like 1500 books now, most of which are volumes of poetry. But the collection also contains literary essays, texts on poetics, translation, geography, history, religion, psychology, literary theory, architecture, design, technology, 
fiction that spans multiple genres and an extensive collection of books on tabletop role-playing games. I've come to see my library not only as an extension of myself and my mind, but also as a space of, for imagination, a space large enough to shelter other minds and other lives. Dil Hongbing, a Chinese poet living in exile in the UK, notes that the poet himself is a China. In other words, even as we are separated from the places that we used to call home, we become those places ourselves, as complex and divided, as expansive and rich. To build a library is to imagine a country in which we are welcome, in which we fit in, regardless of how contradictory we sometimes feel. In 2017, Dow Strom, a fellow writer and artist living in Portland, approached me about collecting collaborating on an art project that would blur the lines between library, performance, and installation. As we discussed the possible directions we might go, we both noted how rare it was for any writer or reader to step into a space where every book on the shelf was written by a writer of color. The more we discussed this idea, the more it seemed essential to create such an experience not only for ourselves, but for the other writers and readers in Portland community, especially those who had never seen themselves reflected in the offerings of bookstores and libraries. We decided to call the project the Canon and applied for and received a grant from the Portland Institute of Contemporary Art, then set about purchasing and collecting a large number of books by writers of color. Dow's partner, a gifted wood artisan, crafted close to 100 open-ended wooden boxes of a wide variety of sizes and capacities to serve as our shelves. These could be stacked and arranged in a multitude of ways, destabilizing traditional and conventional approaches to order. Books were shelved together based on their dimensions rather than adhering to any sort of categorization or taxonomy, leaving those who encountered the installation to wander, browsing and discovering unexpected connections, defamiliarizing the normal library experience. With the existence of a local BIPOC run gallery, we hosted the installation for an entire month and offered poetry readings, film screenings, panel discussions and workshops in this space. The construction of a wholly BIPOC-centered space with a deconstructed library as its centerpiece had a profound effect on the local community. I recall standing next to the exhibit on the opening night and talking to one member of the public who suddenly became overwhelmed. He said, <clears throat> he told me, I've never seen so many books by writers of color in one place. I've never seen so many names like my own on the shelves. I've never felt so seen in my life. <clears throat> In that moment, I understood that what we had built was not a one-time installation or a one-month exhibition. It was to start something much bigger. Okay, you'll have to read the rest of the essay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to jump around here uh, to hear more about what happened with the canon, but uh, I'll skip forward a little bit. I found myself writing a variety of articles um, as part of the online version of the site. Um, exploring and examining the spaces and mechanisms through which canon and literature were conceived. When asked, when I asked myself why I'd never read an essay on craft by a writer of color in any MFA or PhD class, or more pointedly, why my own shelves did not feature any such text, I started assembling a list of articles, chapters, essays, lectures, books, and anthologies written by writers um, of color on craft the workshop and the work of writing. It turned out to be a much larger project than I imagined. The list grew longer and longer, supplemented by suggestions from other writers I reached out to. The questions seemed to resonate with writers, reminding us again that unless the, the void is named, we risk never seeing it. In many respects, the articles I wrote for Buchanan were part of my own efforts to fill the empty spaces in the library, to address the noticeable silence on subjects that were highlighted, that highlighted inequity, hypocrisy, and erasure. What is a library? My personal library has become increasingly complicated. I often struggle to know where to shelf things. Books move, shift between sections, sometimes collect in stacks on a desk, sometimes they reassemble themselves in new places, not always exactly in alphabetical order or separated by theme. My own mind is similarly disrupted, it disrupted. order is more fluid, the interior more dynamic. Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> now, when I meet with different writers, I'm always listening to what they say in our conferences with their poems, what their poems and prose reveals. I ask them what they've been reading, what inspires them to write. Um, I try to introduce them to new writers, new voices, and new texts. And thus, little by little, 
expand the country of themselves, the library of the beloved writing that constitutes their home. My library is not an island lost in a wide ocean, but part of an archipelago, a vast interconnected array of islands, each of whom is a person who is also a library and is also a home. Thank you. My native name is Awanakwe, I am Eagle Clan, and I'm from the White Earth Nation in northern Minnesota, live in Minneapolis. Um, I don't know if anyone's showing the book. You know, like this is this is the book that we're all a part of. And you know, when I was sitting there listening to you, I think of that Sherry Lee can see created this idea of writers of color putting together a book on writing. And it was on that edge of this whole boom of, um, you know, the publishing industry saying, oh, we need the first writers. Uh, and, you know, it's like this came out just right, right as that was opening up. And each essay in the in the book talks about writing, and then there's a writing exercise for people to do. Yeah, so it's a, it's a it's an incredible collection of amazing writers of color from Wow that Cherry knows. Um, thank you for doing this. I'm going to read my artist statement. We are kept in their mindset as vanished peoples or as workers, not creators. And what does this erasing of individual identity do to us? Can you believe you exist if you look in a mirror and see no reflection? And what happens when one group controls the mirror market? As native people, we have known that in order to survive, we had to create, recreate, produce, reproduce. The effect of the denial of our existence is that many of us have become invisible. The systematic disruption of our families by the removal of our children was effective for silencing our voices. However, not everyone can feel that desire, that upwelling inside that says sing, write, draw, move, be. We can sing our hearts out, tell our story, paint our visions, we are in a position to create a more human reality. In order to live, we have to make our own mirrors. That's kind of the end of my essay in this in the book. And you know, so this is from the beginning of my essay. I write to create mirrors. As a Native American child who loved to read, I searched the school bookshelves, the bookmobile, and other public libraries. For, bit, for books with pictures that look like my family. I look for books that told stories I could relate to. Growing up in the 50s and 60s in the United States, those books did not exist. There were books about cowboys winning the West and the Little House on the Prairie series, which held my interest for about all of two seconds. I remember reading every word in Botanica Encyclopedia about Geronimo in Cochise, once I learned they were real people who did heroic deeds on behalf of their people. Given the scarcity of reading material that interests my young native self, my first goal as a writer has always been to create stories my people can relate to. Stories, poems, plays, and articles about Native Americans, about mothers, about young people, about poor people. My plays for theater tend to also include my understanding of the spiritual realm that exists simultaneously alongside and with our human existence because that is how my spirit sees the world. 
And apparently I do the same thing in my current crime novels. Um, the, my second goal is to write stories that present Native people as living people today. We are not a Curtis photograph. We are not a Disney cartoon. We are not a prop for every wannabe manifest destiny movie star seeking a credit roll. We are so often locked in the past and then most often as a plain charged person. We are so much more and so much more alive than that. And then the essay goes on. But I also wanted to say like the, um, like the advice, you know, what advice do you give to other writers of color? My first thing is submit for publication. You can't get published or paid if you don't submit. So you got to submit. Um, two, never say never when offered a writing job. Um, and this is for myself personally. I mean, I decided when I started writing to make my living as a writer. So like, I just had to take the jobs that came and were offered to me. Um, three, know when, where, and how you are willing to compromise. A work for hire is a work for hire. You know, I remember one article they didn't want me to use the word evolve because I was writing for a community that was a more conservative community. I was like, okay, I won't use the word evolve. Um, four, do what you say you're going to do. If you're um, make that deadline, I. I guess that's the only sentence that I will not say that one. Um, five, ditch the fear of rejection. Along with that, learn to actively seek constructive criticism. None of us write perfectly all of the time, if ever. We can always learn more, and we will always improve if we are open to listening to more experienced writers. And so those are the nutshell of my essay in this wonderful book. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beatrice Zimhog. I'm a writer, rocker, and social worker from Sacramento, California. I have worked with people experiencing homelessness for many years. For five years, I did a, a facilitated a writing workshop at a women's shelter in Sacramento. I learned in that shelter that everyone has a story. No matter who you are, you have a story. And every person experiencing homelessness has a different story. How they came to homelessness is individual. There is no such thing as the homeless because everyone is different. A few years after my workshop ended, I became homeless myself a week before Christmas in 2011. The day after I was evicted from my apartment, I bought a notebook because I knew I needed to document this story. And I put together a series, uh, a book of essays about homelessness and long-term unemployment, which I hope to get published one day. The piece that I'm going to be reading today is about something that happened when I was homeless in uh, Southern California in uh, Venice. And we, I was on the homeless bus on my way to the emergency shelter. It, it was published in Aussie.com a few years ago. It involves singing and I can't sing. So please excuse my very poor attempt to carry a tune. It's called Always and Forever. At the bus stop for the homeless bus, someone always has a radio. You could hear it blaring in the early evening air, competing with the sound of the waves and the mumbling of the men and women waiting for the bus. Sometimes it would be tuned to a rap station, spewing words of bravado, disappointment, and hate, with misogyny competing with the baseline for the lowest denominator. Other times the songs would be old soul classics, songs from back in the day when love, longing, and tender betrayal ruled the airways. Today was one of those days. It was Friday the 13th. The bus taking us to the West LA Emergency Winter Shelter rattled up to the Venice boardwalk. Men and women moved toward it, clutching their coats in the crisp January air, made even more brittle by the breezes rolling in from the Pacific Ocean. 
I tried to ignore the mellow sounds as they were sonic reminders of a life I once had. A life filled with friends, family, prosperity, a warm Pennsylvania bedroom and my own cozy bed. It took only a few minutes for the bus to fill with bodies and for the driver and his assistants to store the backpacks and suitcases in the back of the bus. Everyone knew the drill by now. My best friend Mary, who was with me, and I climbed on, the, on board and searched for empty seats. The winter sun sank behind the waves, turning the figures along the beach into shadows. The bus pulled away from the few tourists still walking the street, and shopkeepers started to pack their wares away for the evening. As usual, I turned my head toward the window, watching people walking into restaurants and bars, peeking at lights through windows where dinners were being prepared. I had nothing to look forward to but an old dirty cot, a scratchy gray blanket, and sharing the drafty armory with dozens of other people who had nowhere to go and no one to care. It was a bus crammed with stories. The pale young girl with long brown hair who flirted with the driver every night, how did she get there? The guy with the short afro and darting eyes who discreetly sold potato chips, cigarettes, and weed in a whisper during the shelter dinner hour. He, could he have been a successful entrepreneur, entrepreneur in another life? The woman with the dirty backpack and disheveled clothes who fought off attackers in her dreams. Why couldn't she find a safe haven? The guy with the radio sat at the back of the bus. The organ strains of a familiar song started to waft through the bus. He increased the volume. Always and forever, each moment with you is just like a dream to me that somehow came true. In unison, everyone on the bus started to sing. We all knew this jam. It was the bridal dance song in my cousin Martha's wedding in December 1977. I had the heat wave eight track in my 1975 gremlin when I was in college. But even those who hadn't been around in 1977 had heard the song on the radio at some point in their lives. Maybe their parents had played it. Mary sat next to me wrapped in a woolen scarf and black leather jacket that we had found in a thrift store before the eviction. Even she, the rock and roll purist, knew this song. For a few minutes, everyone on the bus was connected. Black, white, brown, male and female. We had all traveled different journeys to end up on this bus. But on this day, for a few minutes, none of that mattered. We were the song. Some crooned the baritone lead, stretching higher when it's changed to a falsetto while others repeated the refrain of the background vocals, smooth like a gentle caress. Some people closed their eyes and smiled, swaying to the music. Thinking back to a time when things weren't so hard, when they really did believe that the good times would last, when we believed that love could conquer all. I thought about the dreams in my, in, that my friend and I had shared in our 27 years of friendship. As the music faded, the bus was silent for a moment and then some, everyone applauded. Someone laughed and the spell was broken, but we would all remember forever. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Sherry for inviting me to be a part of this anthology. And I would like to thank all of the other writers in the anthology for inviting me into your miss. Thank you. Hi, I believe it is my turn. I was told I, I should read after Beatrice. Beatrice, thank you so much for your reading. I loved your singing, by the way. So it was amazing. Um, my name is Arunik Ashab. I, uh, I grew up in India, uh, in the Indian state of Assam and studied in Delhi University before moving to the United States. Uh, currently, I work as an associate professor of creative writing at the University of Georgia in Athens, where, I, where I'm also the director of the creative writing program. Um, uh, and thank you so much, Sherry, uh, for asking me to contribute to this program, who I met in Minnesota when I was a student there. Uh, and, and Sherry was very generous to ask me to contribute. So I won't speak much, but I just wanted to quickly give this introduction because uh, I think it's very much germane and very much intrinsic to what I have written. My essay in this uh, anthology is called um, Thoughts on a Queer, Indigenous, Multilingual, 
multiracial literary future. Uh, this is the kind of future that I think all of us envision. And I wanted to put down some thoughts on that. Um, and one of the earliest instances when I realized that my state, Assam, where, I'm, where I was born brought up, and my community uh, have a rocky relationship with the narrative of the Indian nation was during a family trip to my grandmother's house in the burning early 90s, 90s to attend an emergency. Our ancestral village is close to the city I grew up in. It was called Guwahati in northeastern part of India. Until then, I really didn't know that Assam was trying to secede from India and become a new country. Um, and, and during this trip, we were suddenly uh, stopped by uh, armed security guards. Uh, and as usual, my father fished out his identity card because he was a central government employer. He used to work for the All India Radio, which is something similar to the NPR, but it was a government broadcasting service that, that is still the, the, one of the largest broadcasting companies in the world. And that's because India is a very large country. But unlike other days, the soldier who was guarding the street wasn't satisfied with my father's identity card. And as a central government employee, as a government employee, he should have been allowed to move. It was very late because we were going for an emergency. And the soldier, the army was armed with AK-47. He said with a sardonic smile, didn't everyone have a family emergency? So we had a very rocky relationship also, not just with India, but also Indian soldiers who obviously was waging counterinsurgency operations in Assam, uh, torturing people, uh, um, to, uh, causing a lot of violent um, uh, atrocities, on, especially on women, burning down entire villages because they didn't like the idea that some people decided to rebel and wanted to separate from India. Um, but inside the car, my mother was sitting in the middle of the three-seater car seat. Um, she was holding my bro younger brother's hands and my hand, because we were both very, very young, with great force anticipating trouble. Growing up in the 80s and 90s in Assam, our lives were very different from the children in other parts of India. We called the rest of India mainland India because the northeastern states of India are connected to the main landmass of India through a 22 mile narrow stretch of land called the chicken snack. Living beyond the chicken snack meant that everything reached us very late from mainland India. We received our dailies a day late, our couriers were slower and mobile phones that worked in mainland India didn't work in northeast India because of security reasons. Finally, we were also governed by a different set of laws called AFSWA. The Indian constitution wasn't followed when ruling the unruly tribes of northeastern North Eastern India. In mainland India, you can't arrest someone without a warrant, but in northeast India, you can absolutely do that. In mainland India, you can't detain someone for more than a certain number of hours without a warrant, and, but in northeast India, you can detain someone on suspicion of terrorism for an indefinite number of hours. In mainland India, you can't shoot at sight, you can surely do that in northeast India. We were dispensable indigenous tribes who fought contextless wars that the rest of India didn't understand or wanted to understand. What is interesting is that these tensions and intersections have led to a growth of a massive outpouring of new English language writing in northeast India that is uniquely different from what the world consumes as Indian English writing. Literature from northeast India that voices many of the concerns I have raised is a new and exciting body of scholarly inquiry for also post-colonial study scholars. Um, and I would exhume a lot of my memories in Minnesota, in snowy Minnesota in 2013, when I would write my first novel, The House with a Thousand Stories, uh, which was published in 2013 by Penguin. But I want to come back to the literary tradition because all of this is related to I think I belong to and I, thing that I uh, enrich myself from. Uh, uh, writers such as me uh, from these marginal locations in India that are often not depicted in Indian English literary fiction, even commercial fiction, or in Bollywood, in any kind of popular, not just in India, the, tri the tribes there, the problems of insurgency. So writers such as me enter the tradition of South Asian English writing or South Asian Anglophone writing or Indian English writing, which has been very beautifully enriched by writers such as Jhumpa Lahiri, Arunuti Roy, Akhil Sharma, Amitabh Ghosh, Salman Rushdie and Bikram Seth. We arrive at this location from a space of exclusion, 
even though I feel immensely indebted to these authors. The work people like us would produce was bound to stretch the possibilities of Anglophone Indian writing. I inherited and was shaped by a multilingual indigenous literary tradition compared to many other Indian origin writers who arrived to the shores of the United States through the complex process of immigration enabled by class and privilege. This changed only in the last 20 or so years and people from lower caste and lower class sections of India have had the privilege of immigrating to better economies, better developed countries and choosing a better life. This is bound to obviously enrich and the conversations on uh, conversations around Indian American literature or Asian American literature, however you want to talk about. But over the years, um, I have sincerely asked myself, like, who am I? Am I an Assamese writer because that's a language uh, I, I write in and it's my mother tongue, or I'm an Indian writer or an artist Indian writer, or even a bilingual writer because I publish a novel also in the Assamese language, in my native language, uh, because I write in my native tongue or an American writer as the US is my new adopted homeland. I just bought a house last month, in, actually in July. I work here now. On the other hand, in the United States, I'm a South Asian writer. Plus due to the amazing work of queer writers who have shaped me, made me feel seen. I feel part of the long queer radical tradition of writing as well. So the answer is more complex uh, and yet can be answered in just one line perhaps. And this is what I'm thinking a lot in this essay. I'm all of it, of course, but if I had to choose, and if I had to choose, I would say that I am an Assamese writer. Um, I may be contributing to the Anglophone tradition, working in the English Academy as a professor of creative writing to the Anglophone tradition. Um, yet my English writing is in constant dialogue with Assamese language literature. I'm an Assamese language writer. Uh, I'm an Assamese writer, but also in the most literary and cultural sense, not in a narrow jingoistic way, of course. And I give a lot of examples from my own work in the essay uh, and, and talk about how it is in constant dialogue with very canonical Assamese literary tradition. And this is a very strong heritage that I want to draw from because, because it is very liberating for me because when I choose to say that I'm an Assamese writer, I'm actually uh, plugging myself in a tradition that started in the 50, 5th century. And ever since that, my community have been writing constantly. And we still read those writings written in the 5th century. It is highly liberating to me and to, to choose to be part of this tradition, inhabit this tradition, because it helps me to operate outside um, Western conventions of reading literature. It enables me to step outside the shallow and often contentious neoliberal literary discourse shaped by social media these days that asks knee-jerk questions, uh, posited with a veneer of morality, mask as intelligence. This is why reading my writing through sometimes uh, even an American multicultural lens of gender or racial identity may not always work, but that is one way of definitely reading the, reading the work. I'm an Assamese writer, influenced and shaped primarily by Assamese literary aesthetics, oral and written, and I'm working in this Anglophone uh, academia. I was brought up in oral and indigenous literary cultures. The ability to imagine from various perspectives is seen sometimes as an indispensable talent, a strength, a possibility, and a requirement. One is judged on whether they are a good storyteller based on the ability to imaginatively inhabit the experiences of other bodies, other souls. So this is an ability, neoliberal literary discourse at times shaped by sociological and anthropological curiosities actually decenters the primacy of the literary imagination if it is, and it is not uncomfortable with celebrating that. Um, but I also elaborate on why I think of all of these and give examples from my indigenous literary traditions and how I have used them in my English work. Um, the oral and written traditions in Assam, they have enabled me to do all of these exciting things. And that's what I write about in my essay. Um, I also draw a lot of uh, inspiration definitely from African Anglophone writers, African American writers, which who are very popular in Northeast India and widely read, such as Baldwin, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, uh, Langston Hughes, and, and, and indigenous writers such as Louise Erdrich, uh, Joy Harjo, and Lian Howe have been extremely important in shaping discourses in Northeast India. Uh, and they shaped definitely, they definitely enabled me uh, to write, gave me the permission to write the kind of writing I want to do today. Uh, so I think this is why I say I am all of it and yet Assamese simultaneously or Assamese or slash indigenous simultaneously. And this, that's why I also say that America's literary future is queer and indigenous, multiracial and multilingual. 
And if it is not, we need to write towards it in daring ways. And I think this anthology is doing a great job of doing that. But coming back to the anecdote I started with, that winter evening, when my father's identity card didn't open the passage in the sea, something strange happened. My mother, my radical feminist mother, who is no more, uh, who, who often remained in the background during such situations because the soldiers were never kind to women in our part of the country, she stepped out of the car. My mother, who was a professor of literature in the state's most prestigious college and had rejected many traditional expectations dumped on her, stepped out of the car with her head covered, something she rarely did and didn't like doing. Her head was slight, bowed. She had become a new person I didn't know, a timid traditional woman by covering her head. Now I know why she stepped out and talked about this, talked to the soldier who had covered his neck and face with a black cloth, black cats, they were all called. Sir, any problem? Asked my mother, who is used to be addressed with respect by her students. She introduced herself. The soldier instantly became very jittery. Sister, why did you step out? Go in, go in, you guys go ahead. She instructed the driver. Something about my mother stepping out was very scary for him. He was as if suddenly scared of her presence next to him. He hadn't expected her to step out of the car and address him. He had expected her to stay in with her head covered, not step out. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, everyone. Hola. I just have to say hi, Candice. Um, thanks, everyone who's read before. I, I was bound and determined. Like, OK, I know what I'm going to read. I know what I'm going to read. And I'm like, no, no, I don't know what I'm going to read, because do you tell the history, or do you? talk about how you're doing right now. My name is Lori Young Williams. I'm a local writer. And I feel like I've been um, under a rock since COVID. So there's part of me that wants to read what's at the top of my head right now. And then part of me wants to read what I've written in the book, but that feels kind of far, but not really, because I'm listening to what everybody else has been reading. And it's just, I, I, I. <laughs> Oh, how dare I write? I write to heal and need to heal myself and see words, create a salve, power of words to knit together a broken or wounded past, to add my family's stories and voices, add my thread to the tapestry. How do I, we fit in black, white, both, neither? I need to write, whether published or not, I need to heal. Uh, what do you need to know about what I'm going to read? I'm going to go with the book. So just go on with the flow, go on with the flow. And I know I'm weaving back and forth. I haven't done this in a while, y'all. I've been, like I said, I've been under a rock for three years. Um, <laughs> this COVID thing really threw me through a for a loop. Uh, my mother is white, still living, taking care of her over in West St. Paul. My father, Black, died in 2008. He was born and raised in Philadelphia. Mom, born and raised in Menominee, Wisconsin. They met here in the Rondo neighborhood. 1956, she was gonna be a nurse, graduated from Hamlin, go out to the mission fields. Dad was gonna be a minister, went to Northwestern Bible College. And yeah, <clears throat> become a pastor. Mom didn't go to the mission fields. They created our family. I have an older brother. Two older sisters, one of whom passed a leukemia in, two, in 1982. Whew. All right, let's rock and roll, Lori. Writing, healing from the things I cannot change. I come from multiple places. I have many stories. I'm a mixed race. I hate saying middle class woman, but I am. Um, I write poems, prose, and personal stories as a way to heal from the racism and sexism that encountered, that I encountered. 
Being a mixed race girl who grew up in the white suburbs of St. Paul, Minnesota during the late 70s and 80s, and Beatrice, I love Always and Forever. Yes, on the eight track, yep, my brother had that. It was a challenge to find a group to belong to and friends who would accept me as I am. Writing kept me from going crazy. I was able to dream and dream big. Dreams were poems and stories. They asked questions. They searched for myself. I didn't believe I was a writer until my early 20s. I wasn't prolific like Maya Angelou or Toni Morrison, nor did I write well-constructed poems like Alice Walker or Rita Dove. But I kept writing because writing helped with my moods. Writing helped me work through my grief, sadness, or anger. It helped me acknowledge that I wanted to belong. Writing helped me to heal. What am I healing from? From being the one who lived. I'm healing from being the one who did not die. The one who continues to live. The one who continues to remember. I have lived most of my life in the shadow of the one who died. One of my biggest life challenges has been the illness and subsequent death of my sister Kim when I was 14 and she was 15. I needed an outlet for all of those emotions and writing is how I dealt with the illness and death at a young age. I'm healing from wanting to be anyone but myself. I'm healing from low self-esteem. But then I figure who isn't? Why couldn't I accept myself as is? Why did I want to be someone else and thought others' lives were easier than mine? I believe my white friends had it easier than me because they did not have to navigate through the lens of race. Having moved from the city where I saw many black, brown, and white people, I made the assumption that I did not have what others had because of the color of my skin. I know that may be a hard thing to believe that a child at my age could leap to that thought or conclusion, but it's what I heard at home. My parents talked often about the inequalities between blacks and whites. I was afraid of not fitting in and fearful that I would not have friends. I wanted to belong and fit in. So whatever I was not was what I wanted. I didn't have examples of self-aware black women, brown women, women who loved their bodies and the skin they were in. My closest representation was my sister. She may not have liked that the boys teased her because she was heavier and mom worried that she wouldn't have friends like our older and thinner sister Deborah. But Kim loved who she was, thick, lighter in skin tone and me and my siblings she conformed, but not like I did. There was a distance she admitted she emitted about belonging. She was not afraid to go against the grain. She was quiet about it, but she followed her own beat. Kim chose to die after two and a half years of living with zucchini. She said, enough is enough. And when she died, I lost my best friend in a beacon to follow the beat of my true self. I grew up knowing my mom's side of the family, German and Norwegian farmers and mechanics from Manana, Wisconsin. Mom said, Friends from the town were sad they couldn't find a nice white boy for her to marry. Grandpa Lem, Lem said he wished she wouldn't marry my dad, but that he wouldn't disown her. Cousin Ginny said there was talk about dad becoming part of the family. All I saw growing up was acceptance of my dad when we went to visit. I knew little about my dad's side of the family, a black family from Philadelphia. My dad said I looked like his mother, Grandma Lizzie, and I have only one memory of her. There she is, my angel, resting on a dark brown floor poster bed, all in white, her gown, the sheets, her face a golden brown, hair pulled back, black with whips, wisps of silver. I walk towards her, looking at her hands, her face. She smiles at me. I wish the blue walls would fall away and turn into blue sky. We would fly off somewhere magical in that four poster bed with the sheets flapping behind us, leaving her sickness in our wake. Just me, and my angel. Grandma Lizzie became my muse and the women from her family started to come forth. Her daughters, her sisters, Black women from my father's family sought visibility through my writing. My dad and I became close after Kim died. He became the beacon that, I, that went missing after Kim's death. 
He and I thought and believed in the same things, that there should be fair and level playing fields for all who wanted access to the middle class, that you do unto others as you want done unto you. He lived his own life. So when he came to me in a dream months after he had died, he told me I have to live my life and no one else's. I knew then I had to heal and be me. Healing takes place on the page as well as in my mind, heart, and body. Writing is a healing component to my health because it allows me to release in a healthy manner what weighs me down. I still get in a jam, blocked or stuck, trying to tell my story, my truth, trying to be honest with myself on the page. Sometimes I shy away because I'm afraid the truth will hurt, but I know what I've written has been healing. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. I am so honored to be part of this reading with all you amazing writers. Some of you guys I have met before, the writing community by Park uh, is actually fa fairly small. I am especially honored to be reading for this East Side Library project. I am actually, I came to adulthood on the East Side with many other Hmong American girls that went on to, I guess, to interesting things for the Hmong community. People were talking about um, Karlin Naimatsu. I'm a product of the University of Minnesota. My first poetry teacher was Sherry Kwambi at the Loft, actually. Currently, I'm based in Washington, DC. And um, I guess what I would say is that I do not have a copy of uh, the book, How Dare We Write, because right now I'm, in, I'm on, on the West Coast. I am spending about six weeks helping with a family emergency. And I think it's an example of how I'm trying to honor all parts of my life and fully live all parts of my life. I'm single, never married. Um, and yet this morning I woke up with baby drool and uh, blood from my you know, elderly parent on my shirt because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just helping with the family um, at the moment. Um, as a writer, I was part of, uh, I, ca I came to writing as part of the Asian American Renaissance in uh, Minnesota, as well as the Hmong literary movement around Pandal Voice, which was really um, not only um, Pandal Voice and the first anthology on Hmong writing really came about um, because uh, young Hmong people who were first generation educated um, and trained in Minnesota started their professional lives. But at the same time, I think at the time we were really thinking about, um, and, and I write a little bit about that in my essay. There was a time when basically writing was just a thing and every young professional that had I guess time at the, was was a would be a writer, and uh, in my essay I wrote it. I, I wrote it a bit about how um, it was a time when writing was a lot more democratic in that way, and later on, I guess for um, Asian American writers, uh, which is the experience that I I know, there started to be a divide between people who are really writers and people who are just, you know, I guess, um, just on the side writer and things like that. At any rate, during the pandemic, um, I had a lot more time once again because we're all locked down. And I, I regularly started to uh, join a writing group. And then um, also because of all the unrests, then uh, I started um, writing more, reading more. And I came to the conclusion that I was actually a writer and poet as part of one of my 
uh, life cycles, I guess, or life parts. I've been regularly writing and publishing for more than 20 years. So regardless of the fact that I don't have an MFA and I, you know, I, um, I haven't yet published a manuscript, I am a writer. As part of that realization, I um, applied for grants and then I'm, of course, trying to teach uh, and I've been teaching poetry because as a non-MFA writer, I have felt that um, writing workshops have been where I've been learning about the craft of poetry, writing, and being in community is really helping me, um, I guess, be uh, an AAPI among American writer. Tonight, I mean today, however, <laughs> I will be uh, reading three poems that um, um, basically represents the kinds of the kind of writing that I've been doing, which is really trying to document a little bit the history of um, my people, the Hmong people in the U.S., and then also um, the experience, the Hmong American experience in um, in the U.S., and then also reconnecting a little bit of the history. So the first poem is actually uh, was published by Lyricality. It's a an online uh, journal from um, from uh, central Minnesota, and it was written in honor of Sunisa Lee, who put the, uh, the Hmong name back on the global map when she won the Olympic medal. Um, she tells the history of her story in praise of Sunisa Lee. Quicksilver breeze flipping iridescent, flexing bamboo slender in tides of wonder. She defies gravity, spins the hands of time, tilts the, the axis of her story. Out of the shadows of clouded past, out of the mantles of winter, her feet strike down genocide, racism, patriarchy, tough from barefoot ancestral journeys over thousands of miles, over burning barren lands. Her ankles age old from curving around mountain drifts and edging of a people's country's boundaries. Her calves slender and sharp like needles, punch down thunderbird thighs and remake the world. Her arms wave like wings and things, fingers like compasses, brown fire eyes. Her fingers fan into hummingbird wings, sweeping zenith, cardinal, horizon, celestial firmament. Her painted nails grip the impossible, like Hmong American dream. She dances among snowflakes falling over frozen lakes, along tendrils of fuzzy green leaves sheltering the gold of squash flowers and of the pink of lady slippers. She escapes the water dragons, the squalor of refugee camps, the fences of host countries, the poverty of immigrant ghettos. She is a new thread weaving uncharted territory, a new moon taming the night. She flies fearless for her father, he of a broken back, as her mother silently feeds her iron will. On the other side of the black marble wall, the Hmong heroes whose names will never be sung with tears of joy as they see her streak across the sky. Blossom beyond their wildest dreams, their Hmong child, lift their Hmong name across the heavens. Now Pelu Mbe Hmong, Do Shandu. Give him a face. Mong moi, moi. The next poem I wrote is uh, from my experience in DC, returning to the practice of law. I would like to note for this recording that uh, I'm one of the two first Hmong American women uh, who graduated from the University of Minnesota Law School. Last year, my peer passed from COVID and although we had not talked to each other for um, 15 years, many people reached out to me because I guess in Hmong Minnesotan history, our names are kind of always together. But at any rate, um, unrelated to her passing, I had also during the pandemic decided to go back to the practice of law. For the Petworth Chronicles of Poetry Log, by the time you read this, this place may be gone or saved, like the people who make this community, holistic in all its laughter, solidarity and fights. 
yes, fights too. Outbursts of heart-wrenching fights about having no money to be in the store, about credit cards being declined, about giving people a job if you want them to pay. The belligerent last dance of people down to the wire. The jokes of a store owner diffuse situations while holding the business line. And yet, despite the skirmishes for the survival of each in this urban jungle, and despite the store owner's background as a new immigrant from Africa, still respect for each other's humanity and the fellowship of blackness, a tie of brotherhood more like a sense of neighborhood, united against the tide of gentrification, a shared raft for those left on the margins of a city's prosperity. Through this open door, their, fellow, their few dollars can still afford the pink of bottled soda, of the orange of bottled juice, of the alluring amber of liqueur, small drops of joy, safe bubbles rocking amidst the stormy madness of daily lives excluded and, uh, and alienated as economic refugees in their own chocolate city. Today, a messenger lily white like a funeral came through the door. A most rare sight in this black store on one of the last historically black, well, histori historically black with their companion Asian stores, sprouting greens and groceries in the, in, in the uneasy piece of inner city coexistence when all others turn it off the light on this city. But I digress, although not, to not forget the Asian black shared history. What purpose might the lily white messenger have? Maybe he made a mistake. Alas, no mistake for this stealth carrier dropping the bomb of a new white landlord's eviction court papers, coming to sink his last black community buoy. Their SOS intersected with a, tra with a trajectory of my search for justice. I, child of refugees of, of the Vietnam War, Actually, for my Hmong ethnic family, more like the CIA secret war in Laos. Still burning with a fire of redress from my parents' forced exile, as we speak the same language of displacement. But my legalese clouds my eyes with the specter of unfriendly rules. So as a store owner carries his heavy cases of happiness bottled in rainbow colors, he says, you feel because you care a lot, and that's good but we have justice on our side, so we fight. And he reminds me, we who are refugees and immigrant or local economic refugees, we also share the language of hope and faith against all odds. Uh, I guess I'd like to do a time check and know if I'm at the end of my 10 minutes, otherwise I'll, write, I'll read a last poem. Time check. One more. One more? Okay, all right. So um, the next poem I will read is really um, about my, I guess my, my father and comes from the process of helping my father edit his father's journal and letters. The English is not good enough. For 50 years, my grandfather's letters sat in silence, folded among the yellowing clothes, tucked in battered suitcases, the ravaged baggage of his heartbroken children, too traumatized to remember from beyond the grave, both his and their country's forcibly interrupted lives. For a half decade, my father toiled to translate his father's letters, love, wisdom, worries, hopes, joys, and pains, shared with his beloved children, sent to a faraway land in pursuit of the sciences and the letters that could engineer and codify the future for their newborn kingdom of Laos. Over and over, my father translates and his children edit and his siblings are concerned. The English is not good enough. Maybe the crystalline French of my father's happier youth cannot find food amidst the muddiness of his English as a second language. Those treacherous sleeps strangle refugees by the, by the tips of their tongues. Maybe the 50 year gap is too great, 
two generations between the war and the current Hmong American reality. Maybe from the safety of a country of salvation, his father's brilliant alliances on chariots of freedom and democracy glitter too sharply with tangled chains of greater powers, political games. My father is not interested in perfect English or polished literary gems. He just wants to tell history in his own words. The family's fear of ridicule assumes he must be stubborn or senile. Diving for the, uh, for the hundredth time in the nebula of my father's world choices, the English breaks like our history. His father's untimely end at the hands of ruthless political foes and his birth country's bloodily aborted future. There is just no way to polish the unbearable wound that both were slaughtered and both were betrayed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you, um, the East Side Library. And thank you, all my fellow writers. My name is Carolyn Holbrook, and um, I want to thank Sherry, first of all, for including me in the second edition of this important book. And also thanks to the ESFL for hosting us today. Um, I'm a writer, an educator, an advocate for the healing power of the arts. My memoir was written in connected essays called Tell Me Your Names and I Will Testify. Um, won the Minnesota Book Award for Memoir and Creative Nonfiction in 2021. My entire career has been about creating opportunities for marginalized writers. Back in 1993, I founded an organization called Sassy the Right Place, an organization in which Sherry played a huge role. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Currently, I'm founder and director of More Than a Single Story a Twin Cities-based conversation series in which BIPOC writers and arts activists discuss issues of importance to us. Through this organization and the University of Minnesota Press, my friend and colleague David Murra and I co-edited an anthology titled We Are Meant to Rise, Voices for Justice from Minneapolis to the World, following the COVID, pack, uh, COVID pandemic and the murder of George Floyd. I'm proud to say that our book has been selected for the fall edition of One Book, One Minnesota, a statewide book club that invites Minnesotans from of all ages to read a common title and come together virtually to enjoy, reflect, and discuss. I'm the mother of five, grandmother of eight, and great-grandmother of two little girls. I uh, want to thank Sherry again for republishing my essay that appears in How Dare We Write. Uh, versions of it were originally published in an anthology called The Poverty and Education Reader, and it is also published in my memoir. I wrote the essay after having taught a creative writing class for teen parents. I had carefully planned the class only to find out that the students needed something else. My original plan was to be professional and use a lot of creative writing exercises as I had been taught to do, but that changed on the first day of the class when the students challenged me thinking that I couldn't have anything to teach them because in their minds, I couldn't possibly know anything about what their lives were like. So I quickly threw out my carefully planned syllabus and I decided to come clean with them. And I told them about my life as a teen parent and about much that I had been through, poverty, incarceration and the so-called juvenile justice system, abuse, violence. Oh yeah, I had lived what many of them were experiencing. And my authenticity and sharing my life experience um, perked them up, and we had a great class for the next few weeks. And then my plans had to change again. And I'm going to read to you from my essay from uh, a part where it changed a second time. Um, okay. 
One of the young fathers in the class was a quiet, rather surly young man named Andy, who never wrote or participated in our discussions. He also never missed a class. Andy seemed more sullen than usual the day after the then Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, announced the Republican right wing so called contract with America, which, among other things, suggested that the nation could reduce the welfare rolls by placing the children of welfare mothers in orphanages. The idea was to prohibit states from paying welfare benefits to children whose paternity was not established, and also to the children who were born out of wedlock to women under 18 years of age. The savings, according to his proposal, would be used to establish and operate orphanages and group homes for elderly mothers. The morning Andy read about the Gingrich proposal, he sat planted in his seat, legs crossed, arms folded tightly across his chest, his thick blonde eyebrows furled in a deep frown, and his lips glued together in a scowl, all making him look much older than his 17 years. Then in the middle of a writing exercise in which, as usual, he had not participated, he suddenly blurted out, I'm tired of the way, like, of, of the way people like Newt Gingrich and doctors and social workers treat us. I want to write a letter to the editor. A brief silence came over the classroom, followed by agreement from all the other students, all of whom had experienced offensive treatment by doctors, social workers, and even some of their teachers. Sue, the teacher of the uh, teen parent class, joined in, confirming that she could tell by a student's demeanor if they had come from a class, um, if they had come to class from a commitment or a class that hadn't gone well. And now Newt Gingrich and his moral majority were insulting them again by promoting a plan that would exacerbate the nearly unbearable restrictions teen parents are already living under. For instance, for the few hundred dollars they received each month in a check and an electric benefit card to cover only the bare necessities, they had to spend inordinate amounts of time doing paperwork to continue proving month after month that they were qualified. Time that ate into the hours they could be caring for their children and completing their homework so they could prepare for self-sufficiency. Moved by their passion, I once again tossed out my lesson plan. I didn't have a clue how to teach anyone how to write a letter to the editor, but I knew someone who did. The previous summer, I had served as interim director of, oh, excuse me, interim editor of my neighborhood newspaper and had put together a series of community journalism workshops taught by seasoned feature writers, sports writers, food critics, and others. One of the journalists was Eric Ringham, then commentary editor for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. I called him and I was happily surprised by his response. I had hoped he would give me a few pointers, but instead he offered to visit the class uh, the following week saying that what the kids really needed was instruction on how to write commentary and an effective opinion piece. When Mr. Ringham came to visit, he went much further. He gave the students a deadline and promised to publish all of the commentaries that were completed by, by then and to pay each student whose work he published $100. I would work with them in the weeks after his visit to help them revise their work and prepare the commentaries for publication. While he explained his work at the Star Tribune and his expectations for the commentaries, and even during a writing exercise he gave them, he couldn't help noticing a young woman who kept laying her head on the desk. He called her out on her behavior, letting her know that he thought she must have been bored or just plain rude. She replied that neither was true, that she was tired. The journalist in him took over and he became curious, wanting to hear her story. Why are you so tired, he asked. I overslept and missed my bus, so I walked to school, she replied with a yawn. No big deal, I'm guessing, he thought to himself, but he asked the next question anyway. How far do you live from school? 20 blocks. Now Rina was even more curious. Why didn't she catch the city bus or, or just stay home? I didn't have any money and I need to get my education. A dumbfounded look came out of his face. He stared at the girl for a moment and then asked what her baby was doing. Next month, she replied, and placed her head back on her desk. Later, Ringham told me that those kids, especially that young mom who wanted her education so badly that she had walked 20 blocks to school in the eighth month of her pregnancy, changed his view of teen parents. Until then, he, like so many others, 
had bought into the myth that teenagers like them were lazy and promiscuous, uninterested in educating themselves or their children. The intelligence and determination he witnessed that day caught him by surprise. The students eager, eagerly spent the next few weeks revising their essays, and Andy, thrilled that he had been taken seriously, fully participated, taking ownership of the project by sharing valuable feedback on his classmates' work and prodding them through the revision process while he also wrote his own commentary. The article, Kids with Kids, Teenage Parents Find Power in the Pen, was published in the Minneapolis Star Tribune on Sunday, September 17, 1995. And a few days later, we celebrated. Sue, the teacher, brought treats and the kids showed up with their $100 checks in hand, along with a few choice words about the negative letters to the editor that had followed the publication. Most of the letters were positive, but I guess it was unrealistic to expect that some readers wouldn't, uh, wouldn't slam the paper for encouraging those awful slappers by giving them money to buy expensive sneakers. Sue and I drew the kids' attention to the letters that had praised their determination and those that showed that uh, some readers were inspired and enlightened by their words. And I learned that coming to being myself, I had inspired students to find their own voices. And here is, oops, here's a copy of the article of the kids' commentaries. <laughs> kids with kids, teenage parents find power in the pen. I think I'm always going to be proud of that. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Candice Creel Falcon, and I have the privilege of being the first essay in the collection, which I always joke to Sherry, if I would have known that, I don't know if I would have submitted an essay, um, but I'm, I'm glad that she um, felt so confident in leading with my, my words, and I'm here today to wrap up our conversation, so it'll be a nice bookend. Um, I use she, they pronouns, and I live on the ancestral lands of the Ocheti Sakowin or the Dakota peoples and um, the Ojibwe folks who were the traditional keepers of these lands in rural Ottertail County, which is in West Central Minnesota. I came to Minnesota in 2004 by way of graduate school at the University of Minnesota and have worked my way further north. Uh, ever since um, and have finally begun to enjoy winter after all of these years. So I want to read uh, just a couple paragraphs that kind of contextualize who I am in from the from my essay in the text and then I'd like to read something new that better answers the question that Sherry asked of us to think through, uh, you know, how dare we write and how are we creating new um, literary communities and homes for our words. So my essay is called, What Would He Then Say? Reclaiming the Personal and Grounding Story in Chicana Feminist Academic Writing. Iden Torres, my Chicana feminist mentor, serves as the Chicana writer who most helped me bridge what I discovered long ago in the library stacks. She continues to shape my writing practice even as she no longer reviews all of my work. I constantly use her as my gauge. What would he then say about this? Where would she push me to reveal more of myself to get closer to the meat of my arguments? What story might I share to paint a better picture of the theory I wrestle and try to wrangle from thoughts to words on the page? She taught me many lessons, but the lesson I try to live most in my writing practice is that we each have an authentic voice, and when we hone it, it cannot be detached from ourself. When we are present and intentional about our audience, our writing sings most powerfully. My songs are only possible because of events. Basing my writing process in exposing and cultivating my authentic voice means that sometimes, most times, writing is a painful process. 
It is a task that requires me to lock myself away with only my thoughts. As an extrovert who thrives on being with others, writing can appear solitary at first glance. Moving the solitary to the communal takes a gentle shift in perspective and helps me feel less alone. With the successful honing of my writing craft, I bring my community into the process to counter the fears of being isolated. Feeling like the only one in academic institutional spaces haunts my reality when Chicanas make up such a small percentage of the professoriate. The demands of the academy constantly discipline. Women of color writers who masterfully blend story and theory bring me back into balance when the demands of academic writing convention stifle my authentic voice. So for those of you who are close readers and are comparing the first and the second edition of the text, um, my personal bio has changed quite a bit since the first publication. Um, the conventions of the, the Academy stifling my voice became so intense that I made the decision to leave the Academy. So um, I have become, be begun a different life as a as a visual artist and as a full-time writer and as such I launched a newsletter practice that I began in May of 2020 that I've been doing um, since then so over two years now and I want to read the essay that I sent out to my newsletter subscribers um, as the one year kind of reflection of the practice um, to give you a sense of why I decided to engage in this way of writing uh, at the time that I did and why I'm still committed to it. So this is called One Full Year. A year ago, I was deep in revisions of paintings and a digital book chapter for a feminist publication celebrating the 50th anniversary of the field of women's and gender studies. In a fit of desperation, in a period of major life and world transitions, I found myself pushing against my academic writing training after a difficult editor back and forth, where the meaning of my essay, which was clear to me and the other women of color I passed it along to confirm, was being forced into a state I did not enjoy for others' clarity. I also was writing a lot of responses reviews perhaps of other artists' work in my last semester of my AFA program when it shifted to online delivery. Instead of learning how to screen print and etching from a visiting printmaker, I was looking at various prints online and writing essays about them. Instead of increasing my clay throwing skills on the wheel, I was watching videos about potters of the past and present and writing reflections about what I was learning through the screen. Ever the attention seeker, I thought these essays should be shared with more than just my professors reading them. As to be expected, I've shared none of that writing over the last year. Instead, as is my style, I've written almost all new material for each of the previous 23 issues allowing me the anxiety opportunity to agonize over the content pretty much every week of the month, because as soon as I send one off, I'm prepping at least the next one, if not the next few. Let's be real though, I really wouldn't have it any other way. Today I'm taking a breath and taking stock of what we've been through together through this newsletter experience. Please accept this correspondence as a bit of on-the-fly assessment and a recommitment to another year of my musings, as long as this process continues to bring me joy. As the readership of this newsletter continues to grow, I often feel myself grappling with the original goal of my experiment, which loosely translates to A, writing what I want, B, sending ideas into the world through my queer feminist Chicanx perspective, and C, continuing to hone my auto teoria writing style. Navigating my goals while growing slash maintaining an audience has pushed me in ways that I did not truly anticipate before launching the newsletter. I find myself frequently checking my ego, 
trying to figure out ways to value this work that is not just about the number of subscribers I have, about the number of clicks I receive. Tressie McMillam, Cottom, and Ezra Klein had this fascinating interplay recently about scale and thick ideas that I've been mulling over since I heard them discussing. TLDR version is that scaling up is often the only value we are driven to recognize because it's the easiest to monetize and upholds the US framework of valuing individual success. As you might suspect, that doesn't vibe with my values. And yet I have to fight the socialized part of me that has been taught and expects scale as a measure of value of my worth with all the ways I'm aligning my digital presence. I'm constantly reminding myself that if I send messages out and if they're received, that's enough. If I simply do it, that's enough. Like my nearly two decades teaching feminist theory, I cannot know the impact those classroom experiences birthed once the students left it. I do fundamentally believe in Octavia Butler's sage wisdom as it emerges from parable of the sower, all that you touch you change, all that you change changes you. It is up to me, to us really, to find different ways of valuing this work, of creating the conditions for connection, of finding space for more complex conversations to unfold, of making space for reflection for transformation. I must also confess that sometimes after sending out my newsletter, I am so raw. I feel so vulnerable and exposed by what I send out to friends and strangers alike. Sometimes this feeling overwhelms me and I cannot do anything else for the rest of the day. I'm learning to value that too. I've started to account for it, to give myself the room to rest after putting myself out there. Some of you know how much time I spend agonizing over this thing, this amalgamation of me in written form. A newsletter, unlike other newsletters I receive from other visual artists, who tend to share about their visual work and what is currently for sale. And yet I am deeply committed to this thing, a space for me to bridge my writerly self with the other parts of me, an actualization of sorts. It is where I practice aligning my feminist scholar self with the painter, with the writer. It is where I work to make sense of my humanity, of this time and place, of what it means to be an artist. I'm drawn to chronicling in the sense of accounting for events as they unfold, but those who chronicle often do so without analysis or interpretation. Chronicling demands that separation. I can't help but try to make sense of the events I chronicle. I'm obsessed with seeing patterns, a synthesizer by nature and nurture. I desire so firmly to have something to hold on to, something that gives structure helps me make sense of our current moment. The minuscule and the largest of forms are not that far apart. It is in this, that synthesizer pleasure that I've been writing this last set of issues loosely connected to my house troubles. And sometimes that has meant the physical structure of the home I make with Vimo or the home we're making in rural Minnesota. Sometimes I've explored the house of KCF this home in myself I continue to map. And those essays emerged out of the first 12 issues where I deeply explored ritual as a framework. Ritual became an important coping mechanism for me as I, as we, navigated this global pandemic that continues to endure and manifest in new horrors. Now in the US, for those of us not on the front lines of essential work in its many forms, we are languishing after Zoom fatigue, after lockdowns, after, after, after. We still remain too close to the experience to do anything besides chronicling. We chronicle in order to prevent future forgetting. Even as I chronicled, I've started to forget last April's embodied dread of lockdown and toilet paper shortages. I'm also starting to forget the April before the last forgetting the exact cocktail of fear, sadness, and relief when I gave my notice to my employer that I was leaving my tenured professor post. Instead, I'm focusing on remembering how April in Minnesota is such a transitory month. 
The spring outside makes fertile ground for the spring within. So I'm at my 10 minutes, but I wanted to just kind of share a little bit about that process of trying to bring together the everyday as well as my feminist writerly self with my other creative pursuits that I do in this newsletter practice that has become a communal offering and an opportunity for others to be a part of that um, writing process that I once saw as so solitary, but we all know is really a communal process. So um, thank you, Sherry. Thank you for the East Side Freedom Library for inviting us here to speak with you all today. Um, I am so grateful that while I am no longer in front of a college classroom, that these words, these stories, these ideas continue to um, circulate in really powerful ways. And I appreciate everybody's presence here. Thank you so much. Those of us that are here in house are wearing our masks. And I could say that my eyes have fogged up because of the mask, um, but it's not, um, this has been very emotional. The only word I can think of is love. My heart is beating. There are 30 writers and how dare we write. I always tell my students, pay attention, pay attention to who you meet in life. And I have to say that everyone in the book, somewhere, somehow I've met you, some I've known for a long time, some I'm just meeting face to face now, um, virtually, um, and I'm so thrilled that we could do this. Um, so again, thank you to Eastside Freedom Library, to Victor Volkman, my publisher, and for all of your wonderful stories and how they're connecting, not just personally, but out in the world. So thank you.